Um, we have Evan Parker here today. Thanks, Evan, for answering all of our questions. Absolutely. Uh, so a question that we talked about, if anyone was here from John Stanmeyer's webinar last week or two weeks ago, was um, a trimmer. What kind of trimmer do you recommend for uh, trimming photographs? Yeah, we've had a couple, um, some inexpensive ones, and then eventually we settled on a rota trim. If I can share that. And they're, they're a little more expensive, but they last forever and they're really exact in the cutting. They go from, <clears throat> I think, 12 inches up to almost 60 inches. The Pro Series is the one that I'm used to, and it's, it's a super straight cut. It, they say it's a self-sharpening blade, so the, the blade lasts a really long time. You can get extensions for the table. So I think the table tops out at 12 inches, but if you want to cut larger, they have a little ruler that sticks out so you can measure using that. Um, they're great trimmers. They're distributed here in the U.S. A lot of photo stores have them. A lot of art stores have them. And then the other great thing is you can get lots of parts. So if something wears out, it's easy to just replace the blade or the spring or something like that. So the, the rotor trim is definitely the one that, that we use and that I see the most in um, print shops, frame shops, other places that we work with. Awesome. So I'll keep asking questions until people start posting their questions in the Q&A. Um, let's talk about desert varnish because I know we get that question almost every Q&A that, that we do. So what yeah. papers should be, you be using the desert varnish on? So the desert varnish is a, a UV and a protectant spray for matte papers. Some people have written in and said, oh, I used it on the juniper or I used it on something else and it worked, which is great. But we've only sort of tested it and verified it on matte papers because what it does is on the surface of an inkjet paper is a receiver layer for the inks. And once the ink is bonded into that, when you use a protectant spray, it, it seals up that, that receiver layer so it doesn't absorb anything else. So it gives it uh, some humidity resistance, scratch resistance, and UV protection. And then if you're just going to display it or if you're selling, for instance, uh, cards and you, you're assuming that people are going to maybe leave them out all year or frame them or something like that, you could spray the cards if you wanted to. It's great for portfolios or limited edition books or things like that, because then those pages will take some handling and they won't imprint on each other as it's closed for a long time. And I think uh, Les Picker did a nice video on applying desert varnish and his, his whole workflow with it. And I think that's on the YouTube page. So if, you, if you're looking for some desert varnish tips and tricks, there's a video that I did many years ago, but Les's is much more up to date and uh, and he did a really great job explaining it. Yeah, and that's also linked um, on the Desert Varnish page on the Moab site, which is just moabpaper.com. Nice. So you have a question from Bob and it says, what are your suggestions regarding adjustments in Photoshop or Lightroom for printing deep reds? So the first question is, have you done a soft proof to see if those reds are in gamut? Because reds and purples are one of those things that can be a real challenge when you're trying to print. So if you're making a print and the reds are consistently coming out different, they're probably out of gamut. Let's take a look at Photoshop. So here's our, our standard test image. And if I want a soft proof, I go to view, proof setup, custom. And I don't know what paper you're using, but we're going to start with, we'll just start with the one that's up here. So Entrada Rag Natural on the Canon Pro 300. And if I turn preview on and off, you can see that the colors change. So those are being adapted to in gamut based on the rendering intent here. If I click OK, and then I go back up to view gamut warning. Everything that just turned hot pink is not printable one-to-one. -one. So there's a chance, especially if you look over here, that that red bar, so on the lower left here, if I look at that gamut warning, that red bar almost completely disappears. So the, the chances are pretty good that if you're trying to print deep reds, then it's just out of gamut and so it won't produce one-to-one. -one. So what you wanna do is make a couple of small test prints. I'm gonna go back to the settings, view proof setup custom. 
And you see here we have the rendering intent. And so what rendering intent does is it determines how out of gamut colors are changed so that we can print them with the inks in the printer. So relative color metric is going to do the least amount of adaptation, and it's going to take the out of gamut colors and move them right to the edge of the gamut, but leave everything that's in gamut unchanged. Perceptual, on the other hand, is going to change everything just a little bit to keep the color relationships the same. So if you have a lot of out of gamut colors in your image, you're probably going to get a better looking print using perceptual versus relative color metrics. So you can soft proof on your screen with those two and then make a test print with each one and see if that improves the appearance of the reds. And then to go along with that, um, he's asking if there are like any, I guess, tips or tricks like such as adding black to help with reds. Hmm. You know, I haven't done a lot of <clears throat> specific toning with with out of gamut colors on images what you might do is try a similar paper and you don't even have to buy the paper and test it you could you could look at say if you're using intrada you could look at intrada the profile for intrada textured you could look at the profile for somerset museum rag and if all those are out of gamut in the reds then you might try looking at a photo black paper, which obviously is going to change the image. So if you want to print on a matte paper, that's not going to completely do it. But if you were to go with a, a Beretta or something like that, that's going to have a larger gamut. In fact, we could just look at that now and, and see. Because sometimes the paper will somewhat determine the image that's going to work well on it. So if we go back to proof setup. We're going to look at the Juniper on, we'll keep it consistent and look at the Pro 300. So if we look at Juniper on the Pro 300, you can see that most of that red is in gamut. So it is possible that some of the challenge you're seeing is just due to the fact that on, on that specific paper that you're using, you won't ever be able to reproduce that red. And if it's key to the image, it might not quite look right compared to the screen, no matter what you do. So changing the paper might be the best way to accommodate that color. Another quick comment here. My gamut warning is coming up as hot pink because I set it as that. So if you go to uh, Photoshop, Preferences, Transparency, and Gamut, the default color for gamut warning is a light gray. and Sometimes the light gray gets lost in, in the images. So if you just click right here, you can pick any color you want for your gamut warning. And, and the hot pink is nice because that's typically not present in any images that I'm editing. So it jumps out immediately as to what's in gamut and what's out of gamut. And George is also suggesting that you could push the appearance, appearance of red by adding black in CMYK mode. Yes, now the challenge with that is all of our files start in RGB and all of our inkjet printers are in RGB. So converting to CMYK to edit your reds could introduce a lot of other color translation issues. Um, so what I would say is probably do an adjustment layer in Photoshop and, and play with um, the adjustments. Um, you can do both selective color, which will let you target the reds, and then you can add black to the reds in selective color. Another thing you can do is uh, color balance, and that will let you shift the entire balance of the image, but you can also do, like I said, you can do an adjustment layer with this and then just mask in where the reds are. So those would be two ways to, to work on it and see if you can achieve a, a change. Um, our next question is, how do you soft proof in Lightroom Classic? Yeah, so in Lightroom Classic, there's a, I can launch it, but it'll take a minute. In the develop module, there's a checkbox in the bottom left for soft proofing. And so you click that. And then in the upper right in your adjustment panels, uh, it gives you the option for 
rendering intent and um, proof preview. Here we go, soft proof in Lightroom. So in the develop module, down in the bottom left, there's a checkbox for soft proofing. And then in the upper right, that will give you the option for your profile and then your rendering intent perceptual or relative. So it's a pretty straightforward two-click process in Lightroom. And then Lightroom also gives you the option for gamut warning. I don't think I have a slide as to where that is, but it's in one of the Lightroom uh, menus at the top of the screen. So our next question from Janet, should document layers be flattened for printing and then additional adjustment layers be added to flatten file as printing requires? For example, levels, brightness, vibrance, what are the best practices? So Photoshop is gonna flatten everything when the data gets sent to the printer. So you're not gonna, you're not effectively sending a layered file to the printer. Um, for, I suppose, the least confusion, what you could do is you could flat, once you're done editing, flatten it and save a copy as a TIFF, 16-bit or 8-bit, depending on what you're editing in. And then you could add adjustment layers on that specific to printing if you wanted to. That would be one way to do it. But if you, if you have the computing power to just work from that Photoshop file, there's no detriment to that. It just might take longer to spool to the printer if you have a file that's sized for 2436 and you're printing an eight by 10 and it's sending it at a thousand pixels an inch or something like that. It's sending a lot more data to the printer than is, is necessary, but that just takes a little time. So I think it's, I think it's mainly a workflow issue and, and how maybe complicated your edits are and whether you'd want to make global adjustments to those or just simple tweaks as to whether you'd change one of your previous adjustment layers or if you want to take that final file and use that as the baseline. So Randy is using a MacBook Pro with a 27 inch Apple monitor, yeah. uh, Lightroom Classic and an Epson P800 printer. <laughs> He calibrates his monitor regularly and he's using current ICC profiles for soft proofing for the LaSalle and the Juniper papers. But his prints are a little off and the skin tones and the skin tones are off too, um, although they look good on the monitor. So any suggestions? Well, I suppose the maybe the easiest thing would be is if your prints are consistently off in one direction. So maybe your skin tones are all a little bit magenta or they're all a little desaturated. Then you could find a, an adjustment recipe to maybe apply globally. So you could do an adjustment layer for, like we talked about, maybe selective color or color balance or something like that and target just your skin tones and, and tint them the direction they need to go and print that and see if it overcomes that issue. Because it, it could just be, you know, not all printers are 100% the same. So it could be just the, the printer you're working with or something in the software workflow um, is, is adjusting those colors just a little bit on output. Because likely skin tones are pretty much always in gamut. Um, Trying to think if there's anything else that would be an issue with that. So I guess that would be my suggestion would be to, to try and see if an adjustment layer, if you can target those, and then if it's a if it's a consistent change that would be the same every time that you could just apply when printing. And you can also email us or probably you just to yeah, try absolutely. to talk it through if if you need some more guidance as well. Does the same image get printed the same using Lightroom, Photoshop, Capture One, or the printer manufacturer print applications? Do I have to process differently depending on my printing software? Ah, uh, so for Lightroom and Photoshop, the answer is yes, it gets printed the same because Lightroom and Photoshop use the same um, Adobe color management module and they use the same print software behind the scenes. 
capture one I haven't used, but it will either use capture one settings or it will use the color management on your computer, whether it's Windows or Mac. And then the printer manufacturer's software is again going to depend. So Canon Professional Print and Layout was built as a RIP. So it runs independently by itself and does all its own data processing and communicates directly with the printer. Um, Epson's, I think they call it Epson Print Layout. I haven't used it yet. I'm not sure if that's built on a RIP platform or not. So mainly what I would say is if you're, if you're looking between those programs and you want to see what maybe is the most accurate, then pick an image and print it from, from Lightroom, from Capture One, and maybe from Canon's professional print and layout if you're running a Canon printer using the same settings and see if those images change and if so, how they change. Um, and that way you would know if you need to do any processing differently. And if you want to dig deeper into that, I would say email me. And I think, Nils, I think we've communicated before about other questions. So your name sounds familiar. But yeah, the only really the only way to know for sure is to make some test prints and see how they come out. If someone wants to print holiday cards, they need a double-sided paper. What do you suggest for printing any type of holiday cards using Moab? Well, I would suggest the Moab artist cards, of course. <laughs> um, they come in three different sizes. We did a webinar, a recorded webinar on it last winter, and we actually have templates on the Moab site for both Lightroom and Photoshop, and we have PDF instructions. Um, so those artist cards, like I said, they come in a small size, which is this one that I have in my hand, and they do come flat and they're pre-scored. And then there's a square card, which is about a little bit bigger than this, but square. And then a large card, which is not here behind me anywhere, but those fold out to be a little bigger than uh, five by seven when they're folded. So yeah, the Photoshop templates have guides for both the inside and the outside and a maximum image size. And in the webinar and on the PDF, we talk about how to find your margins and how to send your image and all those details. So and we were just talking about doing a webinar maybe in November or December to to re go over how to print those in travel loops. Yeah. And it's 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 always daunting because you pick this up and you say, well, that's an odd size and it's got a fold in the middle and I don't know really what to do, but, but once we go through the steps, it's a very repeatable process. And once you get comfortable with it, it's really pretty straightforward to sit down and make a few cards or a lot of cards and, and send them out. And one thing that I know I've done a number of years is made bundles of cards with my own photos and given those away as, as gifts, because it's great to be able to print, to make something of your own artwork, give it away. And then those people get to give those out and it kind of spreads the, spreads the joy orders of magnitude out. What's that? Uh, six degrees. So you get your photos out there, six degrees to everybody else. <laughs> Andy's asking if you have any suggestions on what to use to sign or label the glossier papers. So our slick rock or maybe even our juniper, um, most pens he's used tend to smear. So um, he's been using a Sharpie, but he has no how archival that is. Yeah, so Sharpies are um, durable. The challenge is generally the liquid in a Sharpie is an alcohol ink, and that can separate over time on a paper. So you might see the, the pigment and then the alcohol might wick a little bit of that pigment out away from, from where you wrote it. I know a while ago we had some, some Sharpie archival pens that were very specific that I think we had as giveaways. It might be we should we should make the Moab artist pen and and put that on the website. But I I would go to an art store if there's one close by or look at an art store online. I know uh, Dick Blick is one of the big ones, and they would probably have a pen that would be archival and that would work well. And their staff would be able to guide you to specifically to a product um, that would achieve that goal. Because yes, signing glossier papers is always a bit of a challenge, especially with any pen you might have on your desk, because you never know what's going to happen over time with that. Let's say someone has 
not printed before, they're about to get a new printer. What are the tools that you would suggest someone starts out with, including the type of Moab paper from the printer and inks? And what are the things that people need to get started? Yeah, I think it's pretty daunting. If you have a camera store in your town, that's always the first stop because if they sell printers, they're going to have at least one demo machine. So you can probably make a print or two. And if they have a Canon and an Epson, you can compare. You know, the, the quality and the output is very similar now. So it really boils down to if you're going to print on a lot of cotton, rag, heavier weight paper, um, how does the fine art media loading work? And are you going to print a lot of panoramas? So you're going to need roll paper. Well, the Canon desktop machines don't do roll paper, but the Epson desktop machines do. Um, do you want a specific layout software from the print manufacturer? All these are the questions that, that kind of help guide you as to what printer brand you would go for. And then once you, once you have the printer and you have it installed, uh, number one, watch our video about the print process because that will kind of bring you up to speed on color management and monitor calibration and a lot of other things like that. And then buying a uh, sample box, which is two sheets of every paper, and you can load the ICC profiles, get the media settings going, and then make some comparison prints. Pick one image or, or maybe do a black and white and a color on an 8x10 uh, template and print that on a number of the different papers and see how they change the way the image looks. If you just want to start with one paper, the, the LaSalle, the Photomat, and the Exhibition Luster are the least expensive. So generally, if you're starting out, having a less expensive paper makes you more inclined to do some tests and maybe make some mistakes because you're not worried about spending you know, a dollar fifty sheet of paper to, to see if you can learn something from it. Uh, and, and ask questions. If you're using you know, Moab paper and you get stuck somewhere, you have a question, shoot us an email, give us a call because that's what we're here for. And I have made every printing mistake out there and uh, figured out why I made the mistake. And I'm happy to share <laughs> when you get stuck, what, what happened and, and how to fix it. Because that's the whole practicing, getting comfortable with the process and then understanding how the papers change the image are I think the, the real key steps to, to being a successful printer. So what papers in the Moab line do you suggest get framed versus would you not plan on framing? So I, I am I'm comfortable. I'm happy framing everything. I think the biggest key is the glass that you get, because I do talk with a lot of customers who say, well, if I frame a glossy print, am I going to get a double reflection from the print and the glass? And yes, if you're going to the craft store and you're buying a, 1499 photo frame and you're putting an image in it, you're going to get a really low cost, low quality piece of glass that's going to probably reflect everything. Um, if you take that down to your frame shop and they do a museum glass or uh, an archival glass or something like that, it's pretty much going to be a reflection free framing experience. I did a number of prints for a friend of mine who has a, an office and we did them all on Entrada and then had them framed with, with uh, conservation glass and they're stunning. They have depth, there's zero reflection and, and they just look fantastic. It almost adding glass to a mat almost gives it a little more depth and a little more richness because you have just that extra effect in the frame. And again, I've framed a number of prints on, on Juniper and on Luster and the same thing, the glass just kind of disappears. So it mainly depends on what your budget is for glass and framing as to how that final image is going to look. But I, I don't hesitate to frame all of the Moab papers. Now, something like the, the Unryu with its really long fibers, you know, also looks good in a, in a backlit or a float application. So it just depends on how you want to present your work. But the, the best thing you can do if you have some pieces that you're planning to sell or that you want to display really nicely in your home is find a local frame shop that is willing to spend some time with you to present you with some options because a, a great framer is just as important in your workflow as a great photographer, a great printer, a great retoucher, 
you know, the, the framer is doing that final presentation for you. And a lot of the folks that are doing it have been in business for a long time and, and have a big depth of knowledge on quality and options and what fits your budget and what's going to last. They can really be a, a partner in, in the work that you do. How would you compare museum glass versus the acrylic? There are very good acrylics. Generally, I've only seen acrylics used in really big pieces where glass becomes prohibitively heavy. Often a conservation or museum grade acrylic is actually gonna be more expensive than a conservation glass. So it's not, it's not usually a cheaper option. It's more of a, a size versus weight option when you get to a certain point in framing. And we also set up a new page that lists all the labs that print on Moab paper. So you can search by either the paper or you can search by location. Um, and that's moabpaper.com slash PSP. And I think most of those printers do also frame. So if you want to check that out, you might find someone in the area that does some framing as well. Yeah, and most print shops will know of a good framer in the area because they'll get customers that want something uh, you know, shipped to the customer. So the, the shop will print it. If the shop doesn't do framing as well, they've got somebody across town that does their framing and then they send it out. And back to the artist cards. So on our website as well, which is moabpaper.com forward slash templates, we have those artist card templates that we've been talking about. So we have the installation instructions for Mac and PC uh, in both Photoshop and Lightroom. And then the orange download link is for the template files. And included with the template files is a step-by-step -step PDF of opening the templates or loading them if you're in Lightroom, and then cropping your image, centering it, adding text layers, all those other things. So if you're looking before we do the webinar, if you're looking for a head start on printing cards, we do have the templates and the instructions. And I don't think on here is a link to the video, so we'll have to add that. And the, the entitlements come in a bright and natural, I believe, right? Yes, and it's there's gonna be some reorganizing of the line because right now we have bright and natural and trotolopes and then we have the artist cards in three different sizes and the artist cards are all natural so depending on what your local store has in stock whether they've chosen to stock the artist cards or the entrotolopes or both will determine you know what you'll be able to find locally and of course you can always mail order them if if somebody's sold out do you have any suggestions on how to choose between the Bright or the natural? It mainly it depends on if you're looking for a bright white card base or a sort of warmer white card base. They're both cotton. They're both the same thickness and stiffness. If you put them side by side, <clears throat> you'll see that one is whiter than the other. If you put them far away, you probably won't be able to immediately tell the difference because they're not right on top of each other. So it's mainly just a personal preference as to what you think will best suit your image. The, the entrotolopes are the entrata paper. So if you want to do some tests before the cards in our sample box is both bright and natural entrata. So you could make test prints on those two papers and see if there's a, a difference for your image between the two and make a choice that way. Steven's asking for the best settings for printing on Moenkopi Kozo. Um, and are there particular types of prints that would work best on this paper? Yeah, so the settings are gonna depend on the printer that you have. So on our profile download page, we list the media settings for each printer. So once you've downloaded the profile, look back at that page, choose your printer, and it's gonna tell you what the media setting is to use. And then in terms of file prep, because the Kozo is a velvet finish hand-coded paper, it does have a little smaller gamut than a regular photo paper, and it's going to have a little less detail in the shadows. So a brighter or a higher key image or an image that doesn't rely heavily on shadow detail, those are going to be really great images to print on the Kozo. And again, the soft proof can help to a point, um, but making some 
some small test prints also helps. And, and one thing that, that I use as a tool often is if I'm going to print an image, and let's say this image, I, I wanted to print it large. So we're going to ignore the resolution. We're just going to say, I want it to be 18 by 24. But what I'm concerned about is how are these tones in the black and white going to render? So if I go to print it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the image sized. Here we go to 18 by 24. But when I go to my print settings, I'm going to leave it set to a letter size sheet of paper. So what that means for me is I can use that letter size sheet of paper as a window into my larger image. Because generally when we print 75, 80% of the image, I'm not worried about. I know that those tones or those colors or whatever else are going to print really well. But say maybe I want to see, hey, how do these shadows print? Or for our, our question earlier about the reds, I can just print this section with the reds. So I'm keeping the size and resolution and, and relationships in the file at the final size, but I only want to see this little bit in a test print. So then I would go ahead and print this on an eight and a half, 11 sheet, make any changes necessary. And then I can print the 18 by 24 and be confident that those areas that I was concerned about are going to come out looking their best. So Bob is asking, when applying this printing of shadows trick, does the printer keep trying to print at the full size so ink goes past the paper? No, because you what you've done is, um, we'll go back to that. So what you've done here is when we go to print, we have our image sized still to 18 by 24. So I'm going to go to print. And I've chosen the 7570, so the roll printer. I'm going to go to print set a roll that's that small. So US letter sheet. And then printer settings. And I'm going to choose my media setting, whatever that happens to be. So we can say velvet fine art. And then when I hit save, what it's going to do is it's going to show me the margins on a letter size sheet of paper. And this is all it's going to print. So when Photoshop sends out this print data to the printer, it's not sending the whole image. It's only sending this little bit here that we've told it, hey, we want to print this. So, and it's going to respect the margins on the paper. It's not going to print it borderless or anything else. To, to the printer, you're only printing an eight by 10. It doesn't know that the rest of this image exists. So hopefully that answers, the, answers your question. Um, I use, what is ON1 on my on image? ON1. On it's one. A, a, a relatively new photo editing software. Uh, for my image processing, do you have any videos on printing with ON1? We don't. I haven't recorded any of those, but I know ON1 has an extensive video library of tutorials uh, that's available to, I believe it's to everyone. Some, some of them, I think, are restricted to people who have just um, subscribed to the software, but check those out because they have made a really strong effort to um, to support their software and and do a lot of tutorials on that. And whether it applies to you know uh, your printer manufacturer's paper or to our paper or anything else, all the steps will be the same. When I print on Entrada, my prints have a hazy look. The black look, the blacks look more like charcoal and lack brilliance. Any thoughts on why this is happening? Well, two questions. Are you using pigment ink or dye ink? Because if you're using dye ink, that is not really optimized for matte paper. So that can be part of it. And the other thing to keep in mind is that any matte finish or cotton paper is not going to have quite the same appearance of uh, richness and shadow detail and saturation as you get in a photo black paper because a matte black paper reflects less light and it scatters that light reflection to the viewer. So a, a, a semi-gloss or a glossy paper reflects the light right back to us versus a matte paper kind of scatters it and gives you a little, a little less uh, detail. So the Canon 9500 should be a, I believe the Canon 9500 was a pigment printer. 
so that's good. Um, I would I would make a comparison print on Juniper or on Luster or something like that and see how the image changes because it may be for the some of the work that you're printing a photo black paper is going to give you a more pleasing print than a matte black paper. I'd, I'd explore that first and see how it goes. So someone loves the Juniper, uh, Reggie, do you recommend, or what paper do you recommend to use until it comes back into stock? Yeah, so the, the Juniper is the only Barita paper in the Moab line. And this is where things might get a little confusing. So uh, we also distribute and support Canson Infinity papers. And in the Canson line, there's the Barita Photographique 2, and there's the Platine Fiber Rag, which are both similar to the Juniper in finish and appearance. And those are also both in stock now. So if you want to try something else kind of in the family that is similar but not the same, it would be the Canson Platine or Canson Barita Photographique. And now I know everybody's going to ask, why are we talking about Canson papers in a Moab webinar? But they're all they're all part of the family. So those would be two things to try if you're in need of a, a bright of finished paper before the Juniper comes back in stock. So Paul has an old Canon not, uh, Pro 9000 die printer. Yeah. Um, would I see a big change gamut um, wise with a Canon ProGraph 1000 pigment printer? Can I download ICC profiles for the 1000 to see a difference in soft proof? And is there anything else different that they would see? Yeah, so a few layers to that question. Um, yes, there is a probably a very significant difference in gamut between the 1000 and the 9000. Um, another thing you could look at is the, if you like the size of the Pro 9000 and you don't need the uh, 17 inch platen of the 1000, you could also look at the Canon Pro 300, which is sitting behind me here on the shelf. So that is a 13 inch desktop printer, same footprint as your older Pro 9000. The Pro 300 is a pigment printer. Um, there are definitely gamut advantages. As I kind of mentioned earlier, if you're printing on matte or rag papers, you'll get uh, better shadow detail and a little more detail in general out of a pigment ink versus a dye ink. The other thing you'll see is I believe the 9000 kind of the blacks were a bit warm, especially on matte paper. So if you were printing black and white, it was going to be more of a warm tone print, whereas the newer, well, the pigment printers in general and the newer printers especially are very neutral in their blacks. Um, I would say, again, if you live in a, in a town that has a photo store, hopefully they have a Pro 1000 or a Pro 300 on demo and you could take an image in that you've printed at home. And, and print it on one of those printers and then compare them one-to-one. -one. But yes, you can absolutely download the ICC profiles for any printer and do a soft proof and see if there's a big visible difference in your images. Those would be great steps to do. Steven's asking, when I print envelopes for cards on my uh, Canon Image Graph Pro 1000, I get a black smear on the outside. What am I doing wrong as I don't get that when I print the card itself? Any suggestions? So it depends on where you're getting the smear. I don't know if I have any envelopes here. I might, let's see. Because the the, the Pro 1000 can, can do, can cause you challenges in, in two different ways. So. Here's an envelope. Um, if you're printing on, so flap, if you're printing on the front of the envelope and you're getting smears or head strikes on the edge, it's just because the envelope is, is pretty thick. So what you can do in the Canon software is you can uh, select avoid abrasions. We'll go back to Photoshop. He did just mention that the smear is on the um, back of the envelope. Smears on the back of the envelope. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do the avoid abrasions real quick just so that we go through that because that can be helpful. And then I will address the back of the envelope, which is what I thought it might be. 
So the Pro 1000, and then if you go to print settings, and I know on the Pro 1000, it's uh, matte photo paper is our media setting. So photo paper is matte photo paper. And then you go to advanced paper settings and the print head height, you can select avoid paper abrasion. So that'll help it adapt to a thicker paper. I'm gonna cancel out of here, but your question about the back of the envelope. So if you, unfortunately I can't take you around to our Pro 1000 in the other room, but if you lift the top of that printer and you look inside, there's in the center, there's a, a foam strip with a bunch of little black plastic cubes that, that rise up above it. And what the printer does is if you're printing, say a, a full size sheet of paper, an eight and a half, 11 sheet, the printer gets to the edge of the print and sometimes will use those little vacuum holes to purge ink off the edge of the paper and then go back. So then if you're printing something smaller, sometimes it will go over those, those little plastic pieces and the back of whatever you're printing will pick up ink. So the best way to clean that is open the top of the printer and use I use uh, foam makeup triangles. They sell them in a brick at the drugstore. And those are key because they don't leave any lint or fibers behind. And if you just get them damp with uh, filtered water, you can wipe off those little plastic rectangles and that'll pick up the ink that's been deposited on them. Don't worry about trying to get any ink out of the foam. Its whole goal is to absorb waste ink or, or ink from borderless. But if you're getting smears on the back of your cards or your envelopes, clean those, I think they're little vacuum stanchions in there, the little black rectangles, and that should solve the problem. Is there a difference uh, in printer workflow if the camera has a black and white sensor only, like the Leica Q2M? You know, there shouldn't be, because once you've converted an image, a color image to black and white, it's gonna function the same as an image that, that started its life in black and white. Um, especially if I don't have any experience with the Leica myself, but if those raw files, if you're opening them into Adobe RGB or sRGB or any RGB color space, then the computer is treating it like a color file, whether or not there's any um, color in the image or not. If you're opening those files as a, as a gray gamma color space, then you're only going to have the black and white tone controls. But in terms of output, your workflow is going to be the same. What are your thoughts on upgrading to the newer Epson printers from the P7000 for broader gamut? I doubt you're going to get much of a change because the 7000 has the green and the orange inks um, for Pantone, the only thing that the 7570 really gained was a violet instead of one of the light blacks. And it, it's advertised as having a deeper black ink, but I think that is really only apparent in very specific situations or, or certain prints. So from the 7000 to the 7500 series, I don't think you'd see a big difference. And again, the best way to know would be to, to find somebody with a 7570 and, and have a couple of sample prints made and see if there's a big difference. You could look at profiles, but I'm guessing those gamuts are gonna be really close. Usually it takes two or three uh, jumps in, in printer technology before you see a big difference. So say the Epson 3880 to the P900, there's a definite improvement in, in gamut and, and other factors in those prints because it's, it's two generations of ink development to make that jump. Any recommendations for a two-sided paper that would be used for a self-published book? This would be a book about um, wildlife images uh, of blue herons. Um, I would prefer to not use a matte paper, but feel free to recommend either mauve or Canson papers. So we had to discontinue the dual semi-gloss uh, last year 
And that was our only double sided photo black paper. There's nothing in either line that's going to be double sided and photo black. Um, so you kind of have two choices to print it yourself. You could do not optimal, but you could do just a single sided book on, say, a Barita, because that's going to be that nice heavyweight cotton paper with the with the coating that you're looking for, but they're only gonna be single-sided. What I know some folks have done is they have actually taken two sheets of Barita and, and laminated them back to back and then trimmed. So you get that Barita look. That's also gonna make a really stiff page. So you're gonna to have to decide how you're gonna bind it so that it mostly lays flat. Because if you put two sheets of Barita together, you're ending up with about a 600 GSM sheet that's coated on both sides. So it's not going to want to bend very well. Um, that's the one hard thing about making books yourself, not using matte paper is the, the paper options are pretty limited and it's definitely going to take a little extra engineering to get there. So no ideal product, um, but that's where I'd start. And again, if you have other questions, feel free to email us and there might be some resources I could point you to for a little deeper answer. When printing from Lightroom with a Canon Pro 4000 using sheets, the printer seems to get stuck on a roll default. Any yeah, the printer will that? always default to roll paper because it's a roll printer. So the, the dialogue in Lightroom is gonna be the same as the dialogue in Photoshop for the printer. I will share the screen this time. So in Lightroom, you're going to say uh, page setup. It's in the bottom left. Which is going to be the same as the, or, or I think it says print settings as well. Same as Photoshop. I go to print settings. So we'll choose the 4,000. And we'll go to print settings. So whatever size you're using, let's say it's um, A3 plus or Super B, which is 13 by 19, you can choose, if you choose the top option here, Super B, it's going to expect roll paper. Uh, borderless, it's also going to expect roll paper. Cut sheet is the only one that will respect that it's a sheet and have the printer expect that you've loaded a sheet um, on these wide format printers, you cannot print borderless on any sheet fed media, but you can also, if you have a custom size sheet, so let's say you have 24 by 36 sheets, which may be up in the, in the preset things, but if you choose a custom media size like 24, 36, then under quality and media, you're going to have to select your paper source, whether it's roll paper or cut sheet. But if you're using a preset media size, you have to choose the media size and then the subsetting for cut sheet on both the Canon and the Epson roll printers. All right, I think that's all the questions that we have. Um, if you have any questions that pop up, feel free to email me or Evan. Um, we'll answer those questions whenever. And then we will do another one of these Q and A's probably in January, we were just talking about. Yeah. Um, so we'll send an email when we when we plan that, and also we will plan the card webinar for hopefully within the month. Yes, absolutely. Um, but thanks everyone for joining. This will be on the YouTube channel in a few days, and anyone that was asking about a specific video on our YouTube channel, feel free to email me, and I can send that exact link to you. Or YouTube.com/slash Moab Paper, and then you'll see all of our posted videos on that page. All right, thank you so much, Evan. Thank you, take care. All right, bye. Bye.